Big <laughs> shout out to Bean Working Espresso down in Skyring Terrace, Newstead. Best Hook. coffee in the game. Best absolute coffee in the game. Hooking the platform podcast and any listeners up with a 10% discount. Shout out. Shout out to Yol- Yolanda. Yolanda. That was a mouthful. Their coffee's real fucking good. Get Best it. coffee in the game by far. Just opened up Skyring Terrace. You can order ahead and mention the platform podcast for a 10% discount. Be bad and Brandon. So, all right. Welcome to the Platform Podcast. And we have welcomed by very special guests, Anthony Mexa and Adrian Sutter. Welcome, boys. <laughs> hey, guys. No way. There will be an applause in the actual audio. There's a massive live audience here in front of us as well. Oh, God. <laughs> you can't see or hear them. And that's, yeah. <laughs> Now, but before we kick off into the crux of it, we like to start off with a bit of a question. big, big question, mm. a little bit of an icebreaker. Now, it's 21 words, who you are and what you do. We count every word sound that comes out of your mouth. Now, we one each. Yeah, we'll go. We'll go. One they each. both got to do it. Yes, agree. I reckon Adrian will have to go first because he was late. So. <laughs> Max is like, yeah. I don't want to talk, mate. I don't want to take up any words. Tell me when we're good. <laughs> All right, 21 each. 21 each. You've got this, Adrian. All right. Ready and go. I am Adrian Sutter, um, founder of Swiss 8, uh, Army combat veteran. Can you hold your fingers up, mate, so I can see them and see what we're up to? Yeah, 15. Uh, and I've got two kids. There we go. That's oh, good. Came in just under. Really nice. <laughs> Max, you're up. Right. Anthony Meixner, uh, retired combat veteran, work for Swiss 8. What are we at? You're at 10, mate. Ten. You're at 10. <laughs> <laughs> Take your socks off. Uh, and no, I just enjoyed training and uh, sort of helping out now that I'm out of the army. Nice. Nice. Now, I think you both roughly hit 21. It was a bit yeah. hard. It's always harder to count on these Zoom calls, but close enough. Close enough. And it gave us a good good idea of who you guys are. Tell us about Swiss 8. Yeah. Oh, I'll jump in on that one first if you want, Max. Uh, it's, a, it's a health promotion charity uh, at, on face value. Uh, it's, it's founded and run by Australian uh, combat veterans. Uh, it, it, we built a, our flagship tool. We built an app. Uh, it's a proactive mental health app. Um, it's basically helps you program your life holistically. Uh, we build it. Obviously, we've we've lost a lot of mates to suicide, and there was um, there's a shitload of organisations out there, both ex-service organisations, mental health organisations, all focusing on hotlines and reactive tools to get people who who kind of put their hand up and say, "Hey, I'm having trouble." They'll they'll direct you to services that can treat that that symptom or that issue. Um, but no one was looking at the holistic model and the proactive model going, why don't we try and get some tools and training into the hands of these people before they actually start spiraling downhill and before they're, they're kind of fucked. Um, and the other big one, our, our core demographic is dudes in our kind of age bracket, uh, both veteran and civilian, that is the highest risk demographic for suicide. And they're also the kind of dudes who aren't going to put their hand up and say, Hey, I, I think I need help. Slowly but surely that stigma is disappearing, but but um, nowhere near fast enough. So me, Max, and a few of the other boys were like, let's let's put some stuff out there. Let's put some information out there, uh, education tools out there that, that show people how to stay in a productive and, and healthy lifestyle, which will stop them from, from getting anxiety and depression or at least improve their anxiety and depression um, if it does kick in. Um, and then we turned it into an app and, and that's... That's where Swiss 8 was kind of born. Yeah, that's good. When did it all start? Uh, I mean, depends where you, where you want to call the starting point. The, the organisation was registered uh, about two years ago. Uh, when did it all start? Realistically, I mean, when we, I, I got out of the Army in 2000, end of 2011, officially at the start of 2012. Um, a couple of years after that, I started having my own dramas off and on. Um, all the boys have, have been through their own shit at different times. Um, and I guess the conversations around that started um, 
five, six or more years ago. Uh, then Birdie, one of our close mates, Jesse Bird, uh, killed himself. Fuck, what was that now? 2017. Um, and that was that was the catalyst. So that was the, the trigger for us to go, fuck, you've got to do something, boys. You can't just keep pretending you've got good ideas and talking about them around at the bar. Like, this is a sick idea. We should do something. And then six months later, you've done nothing. Birdie was the catalyst to go, we have to pull our finger out and, and make some changes now. So realistically, that's that's when this thing started. Yes, sweet. And were you always thinking an app would be the great way to get it moving for everyone? Or? Nah. <laughs> nah, we, we had... um, I mean, the idea, this is an idea that, that kind of heaps of veterans have in the back of their mind is get out. You want to get away from people. You want to just get the boys together, hang out, go and get a farm. Um, and that was our original model, like get a farm, put these training tools together or these, these training packages together and we'll bring people out to the farm and we'll teach them. But... Um, as as any good business model will show you, like the, the big flaw in your plan, you, you find them early so that you don't dump all your money and then fuck it up later. But just getting a farm, that's like two million bucks, getting it and getting it built, getting a property in a location, you need two million bucks. Then you need the money to, to get a team to build the courses out. Um, and that course, you got to fly people in or you got to pay logistics to get them in, keep them accommodated, run the course for maybe 20 or 30 people. And so we're like, that is high expense, low return. Um, an app, while it's expensive up front, ongoing costs are far lower and you can reach everyone. Um, so the app was kind of a, the app, the app was the, the concept when we first um, kicked off Swiss 8, the brand, but pre, like all the planning before that, there was, there was definitely other ideas that we failed pretty quickly. <laughs> I think every good business has some sort of failing before it really takes off. And how'd yeah, you, absolutely. How did you find it to get an app going like that? Did you guys have much idea what an app was and how to do it? or? Um... Um, I was kind of kissed on the dick with that. My brother's a software engineer. My ex-wife's a, a digital designer. It was kind of having them around me. that It was like, hey, we should put this into an app. That's a no-brainer. Um, Dreamworld, they were just going to build it for us so that the cost was, was super low. Uh, but then when my brother kind of scoped it out and he's like, this is a, a six to 12 month build. I don't have savings to, to sustain myself for six to 12 months while I build your idea um, and nothing else. So they had, they both had full-time jobs. Um, we ended up outsourcing it and got a, got a Bulgarian team to, to do the development. Um, XY still did the design, but um, yeah, I mean, that's where the concept of putting it in that came from those two. And, and they had, all the, the, the knowledge behind how to build it and how to do it. They passed that over to me and, and kind of said, all right, we'll, we'll guide you in the process using these freelancers overseas. Yes. Yeah, right. Now, cool. it, within the app, now you talk about um, before that, like it's, it's around getting people proactive about doing something about their mental health. And like, as you said, a lot of the treatments that we, you know, we go through for mental health is all once we can recognize there's a problem. You guys have kind of gone the opposite end. And go well. Let's try and prevent this in the first place. What does that look like in you know within the app? Um, Meg, I'll, I'll I'll keep talking until I um, run out of battery. So Max, feel free to jump in whenever you want. But <laughs> proactive stuff like statistically, um, about seventy five percent of veterans experience some form of, of anxiety, and depression, and post service. Um, the when is is still a bit of a grey area. Some some surveys say it's within 12 months and it's, it makes it adjustment disorder. Um, some say it's within three to five years. I mean, everybody's different, but statistically we know the majority of veterans are going to experience anxiety and depression. Mm. Getting tools to them proactively as far upstream is a no brainer. Um, now the way, the way we do it in the app, it's the, there's kind of, we, we coined a bit of an acronym trip around tribe routine, identity and purpose. They're the four things that veterans kind of said to us is the main um, issues that, that cause their mental health decline. Routine, you've got a wicked routine in the military. You train all the time. Uh, you, you, you go to work at the same time. You eat at the same time. You're doing all these things to schedule with discipline. That is kind of the military model. Then you get out of the army and that kind of all fades away. It disappears. Not, not just that it fades away and disappears. You deliberately try to say, like, there is no one telling me I have to get out of bed, so I'm not going to get out of bed. There's no one making me go to the gym. It's not part of my job anymore. So fuck it all. I'll train later and then slowly but surely it, it like falls away. 
Um, the massive one is is the tribal disconnection stuff. And these are all human problems, right? Like you guys probably experience this stuff too. When you're around your mates all the time, you're kind of good, healthy, happy. Nothing can really fuck with you. Um, then when you're alone, separated, disconnected, shit just falls apart. Um, so in the app, obviously, we've got the the four, the four top four pillars, fitness, nutrition, mindfulness, and sleep. We've got programs built in there. You choose the programs you want to run with. Um, put them onto your schedule at a set time every day for whatever days a week you're doing it. And that starts to build the habit. So you're building habit around training at the same time, eating at the same time, um, all that kind of good stuff. Then the the bottom four are more focused, especially personal growth, more focused around that identity and purpose bit and bringing people together. Um, personal growth, it's essentially learn new skills. I mean, I, I compare getting out of the military to people turning 30. Everybody turns 30 and they're like, fuck, I'm not a kid anymore. The best days are behind me. <laughs> if you keep learning new shit and keep growing as a person, you'll, you'll generally be good to go. Um, so that takes, that, that helps you guide towards the finding a new identity, finding a new purpose. Um, like linking people with gyms and stuff like yours, perfect example, chef gets out of the military, disconnected from tribe, finds a new one at the gym. I mean, that whether he's spoken to you boys about it or not, the powerlifting crew at the gym becomes your new tribe and that kind of keeps you sane. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of Kane's biggest things is like he walking into, you know, the gym, he was like, I haven't seen a community like this since he left the army. And like, we look at him now. Like everyone everyone listening pretty much knows Kane because we rag him nearly every, every episode. Big show. The big show. But like, you know, bloke that I first met barely squatted 250, had no other real, you know, goes to work, has his family, but was still looking for something else. Now, at the top in Australia, like squatting 375, helps out others in the gym now, is at every comp helping someone else, like, and he's got purpose back. Such a- 100%, man. 100%. I think, I think that's why it's so important. Like fitness, we, we do put fitness at the top because fitness is sexy and it's easy to sell. If people see that you've got a mental health app, they're like, eh, probably not for me. You tell them it's got fitness and food and, and yoga and shit in there, and they're like, yeah, we'll give it a go. Um, but fitness is the biggest one. Like that is, especially for, for, for blue collar kind of dudes, once you've lost one form of tribe, finding a new one in some form of fitness, whether it be the footy club, um, CrossFit obviously built a brand around creating cult-like tribes. Powerlifting now is kind of moving into that space where your powerlifting team is is your identity. It's like who you are. Like I, I do this all the time and that's, Fitness is a massive one for, for finding tribe again. And Max, how did you come, like you guys obviously know each other from the army, but were you on board with this idea from the start? Like as soon as Adrian's like, whose idea was it first? Adrian's idea. Um, yep. when, and uh, mate, I was on board from the start. I met Adrian uh, and then we, we did in Afghan and we did rock all together, which was like your overseas holiday in between, I suppose you call it holiday, get like two weeks break from yep. your deployment to go somewhere. We decided to go to Prague and, uh, and Oktoberfest. Um, yeah. <laughs> that would have so, been good. Yeah, no, it was terrible. Don't go. No, it was really <laughs> phenomenal. It's like, it's like Disneyland for adults. But um, so then we got back and, and uh, everyone was sort of, I mean, it, it was great, dude. 2011, 2000, oh, sorry, yeah, 2000. 10, 11, 12, everyone's still together. And then people start discharging or leaving, you know, and, uh, and then we had a couple of guys commit suicide and we're like, fuck. And then it, like I said, mate, every time we'd catch up, we'd solve the world's problems over a pint. And then, we'd never, you know I mean? As you do, you're like, I can, I know how to run a country. Um, and then you get to there and you're like, yeah, let's sort it out. So yeah, I was, I've been in, it's Sutter's, Sutter's inception, Sutter's little baby, but I've been in from the start, mate. Yeah. Uh, now, for yourself coming out of the army, Max, was it uh, to going back to what Adrian said before the adjustment period? Did you find it just as hard? Yeah, well, <clears throat> yeah, I, I was lucky because I had a transition moving from one to another, but uh, definitely relocating and not going to work every day uh, yeah. with that group of people. Um, yeah, dislocation through geography as well as from separation from community. Yeah, it's a big one. I didn't think it would happen, especially knowing uh, all the warning signs and having that introspection, but it yep. does, yeah. It did. It's, it was something that just creeps on you creeps on you over time or is it something that you're like, you know, one month out of the army, you realize, oh shit, something's not right. 
yeah, I think it's about that month period. For me, it was anyway. I knew I was like, I'm fine. Everything's good. Um, training, keeping a routine. And then you get to that point where you're like, nah, something's not quite right. You, you know, things, you sort of start realizing you're not, you're not getting out as much, seeing people doing things, and you, see, you can see stuff start to fall off. So, yeah, yep. Fuck. Must be pretty cool to, um, with the growth of the app now. It's obviously grown a lot from the from day one to see how many people you guys help. Yeah, I mean, it is. We've got a long way to go, mate. I don't want to pretend that we're, we're kicking super goals yet, but um, it's, it was good to see from day one. Well, mate, the first year, no shit. So in, in tech, you build a, a, an app to an MVP. It's a minimum viable product. Um, we probably put too many bells and whistles on it when we handed over to the Bulgarians and said, build this. Uh, and there was a little bit that was lost in translation. The, the app that we released to start with was, was full of bugs and didn't really do exactly what we wanted it to. Uh, so traction was kind of slow at the start. And I think it was, it was also slow because we weren't proud of the, the product that we would build. Um, there was pieces in there. I mean, it, if this was a product that wasn't mental health and people weren't actually looking for something like this, we would have probably pulled it for six to 12 months, rebuild it and then released it. Um, but there was, even in the broken version, there were some tools in there for meditation and, and for getting to sleep and stuff like that, that a lot of the, um, cl- our closer mates were using. So I was like, fuck it, we're going to get some bad reviews, but we're not pulling it down. Uh, and then we finally got some support through COVID. COVID was kind of a blessing in disguise for us. Yeah. Um, as shit as it was for the world, it made the world realise that mental health is something we need to pay attention to. Um, and BHP got behind us strongly and they're like, hey, we need to, we're, we're throwing money at stuff that helps the community through COVID. Um, this is this is obviously a, a good idea. Um, they put money behind it. We rebuilt it so that it was open for free to everyone, not just veterans. So um, the, the kind of, I guess the brand message behind it now is this: the, the concepts are built by veterans through veterans lived experience, but the tools that we've built are for everyone. Um, and since we rebuilt it, we've got a, a brought my brother in as our chief technology officer, um, made the app bug free, super sexy. We cut a few of the bells and whistles out, which we'll slowly add to now. But since then, the, the, the user base is growing um, rapidly, it starts steadily, like steadily growing now. Um, plenty which of good is good. Guys on there now, obviously. Yeah, we're getting plenty of good testimonials and, and people people giving us raps. To, well, even not not just us, but the, the people, obviously the veterans who have provided content for it, like Coves is um, uh, probably, a, he's one of our ambassadors. He's a strength and conditioning head coach at Tiger Muay Thai in Thailand. He wrote a program and we get heaps of praise for that because obviously he's a fucking fitness genius and, and put together a good program that's easy for everyone to use. So yeah, a lot of the testimonials and the kudos go to the guys that actually guys and girls that build programming for us, which is good. That's awesome. Like the concept is so wicked and it's based around, as you said, what was the acronym you used? Sorry again, TRIP. TRIP, Tribe, Routine, Identity, Purpose. Um, now, I'm not going to lie, the, the, the concept of, of Tribe, the actual information that came to us was the issue we're facing is isolation and separation from our mates. Mm. No one actually goes... Yeah, my biggest issue is I don't have a tribe because that's just yeah, not yeah. a word that people use. We did play around with it so that it turned into an acronym because the fucking army loves acronyms, mate. So. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, that's... And you got that from the veterans, you said. So you obviously surveyed a lot of those guys and like, oh, what's the biggest thing you're all missing? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Dude, like we, we do surveys uh, with our core demographic of guys. It wasn't... It was not a... It wasn't a broad survey by the least things, but it was... A, it was to our core demographic of uh, gunfighters from combat like deployments and and this all come out of that and it was the evidence was overwhelming dude so we're, we're actually instead of telling people what they want we ask them what they need and yeah. then we implement it mate which is different from some of the other larger um, super PC uh, media washed charities they they can't do what we do because they have to be so fucking gender neutral bloody pronoun non-specific non-aggressive uh we can tailor it towards the high demographic risk of guys which is which is the uh high performing combat shooters yeah yeah Fuck. so you guys are constantly doing sort of survey and is there any um updates or anything you'd like to see add to the app over coming time 
Um, we've got the next 12 months planned out for what features we're going to release. Yep. Um, some of those we'll keep secret until they're out there because it wouldn't be the first time that someone's... Well, heard, well I've, I've presented ideas to people and three months later they got 10 times the budget we've got and they build it quicker than us. But um, <laughs> That's fucked. Oh mate, there's there's a few. It's it's, it's at the end of the day. No, we yeah, can't drop those names. Nah. Mate. We can't drop those names. I'll tell you. When, when, we'll have a we'll have a, a private conversation, mate. After when we get offline. Off I know some big fellas that can just rock up somewhere and you know intimidate. <laughs> oh mate, talk, mate, mate. Dropping people is not the problem. We got to we got to save it for a rainy day, and we'll um. We'll release it when it needs to be released. But no, there's, there's, we've got, we got plenty of um, plenty of new features coming out this year. 2020, uh, 2021 is looking like it's going to be heavily research focused. So we've got uh, Newcastle Uni starting a psych study using the app or a psych PhD uh, will essentially prove the app as an intervention for anxiety and depression. Um, we've got our next release without telling you exactly what it is. It's, it's designed to create tribe. It's designed to... Go or, and accountability. So um, the feature. Oh fuck it! It'll be when's it going to be out? It'll be out in the next couple of weeks. No one can beat us to the punch on this anyway. Um, it's just it's a simple teams feature to allow you to put your entire training team together um, so you can communicate, so you can can track each other, and and um, the leaderboard inside the app, um, which we we pulled down and then we're putting back in now as part of this teams piece, is so that you can get competitive. Um, because we we all know like no one and everyone in the mental health game is like Max said it's just it's so cotton wool based and so like hugs and and trigger words and safe spaces I'm like if fitness is a key um, metric to to reducing anxiety and depression why don't we use the tools that that good fitness groups use and that is like CrossFit um, like like any kind of gym where you bring your team together and it's competition going my teammates are going to keep me accountable they're the ones that are going to make sure I don't fucking rock up at 6.30 instead of 6 in the morning. They're the ones that are going to make sure I'm going for PRs every month instead of just going through the motions of, of being at the gym. So, yeah, that'll be the, I think that'll be a bit of a game changer. A good feature will be the, the implementation of allowing team groups to come together and, and network fucking, on the app. That's fucking cool. Because, like, competition creates challenge and challenge keeps us moving forward. Like, we're not being Correct. We are just slowly, slowly dying. Yeah, 100%, 100%, mate. 100%. That's why I love it, mate. I love the power, sport of power of thing. I love uh, the strongman competitions. I like the incremental grind to get better every each and every week. And when you're talking kilos out of, out of 370, whatever it is, you know, yeah, it's phenomenal, dude. And I think that improvement and, and when you can watch that and see that in your progress, I think that gives you something tangible to latch onto as well. Do you know? hundred percent. You can see the, like it mm. becomes a, as you said, a tangible result that you can see yourself progressing. You can see the reward coming at the end of the 12 weeks or whatever, even though the last 12 weeks sucked and you hated most of it, there's a reward at the end, which keeps us definitely coming back. Yeah, it gives us something to continually work on and work towards. And it must be good for you guys to see someone like Shep and Kane. And I don't say this often, but I'm going to give them a shout out, you know, doing such great things for like mental health around and like off the back of you guys, like, you know, there's not a day goes by that he doesn't talk about the Swiss eight, what you guys do. And he's very open about it about his own mental health journey. And it's got to be, I guess, rewarding for you guys to see that that's kind of the influence you've had as well. Yeah. Um, for, for Shep and for such a dude to be, I mean, he's the perfect example of someone that is in our corner. And you never really expected. It. I mean, the guy's a fucking Titan, mate. He's a, he's a strong dude. And I don't know in, in your circles, but, but for me, if, the, the strength and the numbers that he pushes out, like, that's a good ambassador to show anyone, hey. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, he's a good dude, man. And, and I'm glad he come on board. And for him to, if he can come forward and, and say, hey, you know, you don't have to be good all the time, but you can still perform in life and you can still go forward and kick goals. It's an absolute testament to it, isn't it? So. Yeah, 100%. Like one of the strongest men opening, you know, opening his own, his mouth and his heart and be like, you know, I'm not good all the time. I think it, it's a certain um, vulnerability that shows this strength. Yeah, and how many people reach out to him now? Yeah, chat to him when they're having their bad days and shit, all because he's mate. It's just it's, it's the same in in military units. Like the, um, no one wants to be the first to put their hand up and say I got dramas, but as soon as you get someone who's bigger, badder, and stronger, 
put their hand up first, that gives everyone around them license to go, fuck, if he's done it, I can do it. And, and I've seen it recently with, with some of the special forces guys in, down here. Um, knowing that there's a couple of boys that have had a few dramas, like nothing wrong with them. Their performance will go straight back to normal. It's just normal like brain chemistry shit. Um, but they would, would have been happy to just fucking go through life in like torturing themselves, not knowing what's going on and, and until with one of them put their hand up and said, Hey, I've been having these dramas, anyone else? And everyone's like, Fuck and hell, thank fuck, me too. Like, yeah. If you, powerful. I mean, you guys have been in the military for for a while, which is two thousand eleven, you said you got out. Is it I guess back then or even before that, there probably wouldn't have been many people talking too much or willing to put their hand up and say they were struggling either. No, I don't I don't think um the, the boys definitely, we didn't know how, the, how to go about it. Uh, I don't, I think, like that's 10 years ago. I don't, I don't want to pretend the world's changed that much in 10 years. But um, even the psychs, like I went, so I, when I first got out, I got out because my sister died. Like, and I went to a psych in the army. Um, and they gave me a box of tissues. And then once I was done, they were like, sweet. There was no like going book in for follow up. There was no nothing else. I'm like, what the fuck just happened? I am never putting my hand up ever again. And that was kind of, yeah, it was weird, man. It was super weird. But um, there was definitely none of the boys talking about mental health dramas. Yep. Um, I'd see, and I don't think it was, it was that no one wanted to talk about. I think self-education and introspection, because the boys obviously had just come. So we had, a couple of, we had a couple of busy years at one hour. And I don't think it was that they were hiding it. I think it was just that they were didn't know how to talk about it or even what the fuck was going on for some of it. Yeah. Um, I mean, alcohol intake was phenomenal in the, in those years post all the things that you don't do for good mental health was the opposite, but a lot of them were coping mechanisms. Um, and I, th I don't think boys knew what was happening to them. Yep. And I don't think they knew how to reach out or who to reach out to. And cause you certainly couldn't be the first one, you know? So and then, like you said, sometimes the person you reached out to wasn't much help either. <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah. But no, like Mick said, it, it was a big education gap. Like I, I know when I first got out, um, for probably for the first three or four years, every time I'd go to, to an uncomfortable social situation, we were just surrounded by people. Because again, knowing now that I was completely separated from trial, I had all the boys were still in the army um, in Newcastle. A um, couple of years out, I've got this new missus going to, and she was a, the, the designer go and hang out with her mates um lovely people not my people mm -hmm. they work in office buildings um they do computers and 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 most of them are designers real artsy great people nothing in common with them and i small talk is my fucking kryptonite mate. i hate it so i'd go to these parties um and i so like, started a podcast <laughs> <laughs> podcast is about real talk right but i'd go to these parties and i'd sit in the corner my brain didn't work properly and i'd get super sweaty and i'm like what the fuck is going on I, like I've, I've told this story before but i felt like i had like a sweating problem and my brain was just retarded when i was around creative people and then find out three years later that that is cortisol just shooting to your brain fight or flight response kicking in um and so i had no idea that i was having anything that was like a mental health issue i just thought i was a sweaty mess um so yeah education's a massive part of it mm. that, that's, i just love that you didn't like address oh there could be something wrong i'm just a sweaty mess i'm just yeah. a hot sweaty mess <laughs> <laughs> you're in darwin yeah, yeah. There. But how long were you both in the army for? Um, Max was in way longer than me. I was in full time for just under six years. I think I went over six years, but I my discharge from the day that I was out of the army to when I actually got paperwork to say I was out of the army it was a few months. So realistically, just under six years. Yep. I think I ticked over 18 years at the end there. Wow. Oh, wow. I was 17 when I joined. So most people were like, I was that idiot kid that had no life experience, mate. They would have hated me. Just an idiot, <laughs> right? You don't even know. Like, if you think about it, when I don't have kids either, but I've noticed in my nieces and nephews, they don't, you can't even have proper conversations and, and exploit sort of fairly deep thinking when they're, what, 11? You can yeah. have proper, you know, 
conversations with them. So six years later, you're joining a military and you're like, fuck <laughs> dude, you only just figured out how to talk six years ago. Like let's, let's fucking figure it or think, you know, how, uh, how was that going in there, Max? Like being so young, what was your experience? Mate, I thought I was going to fucking die. So obviously if you're 17 years, if you're 17 years old, um, basic training is six months. That's like a fucking eternity. You have no, you have no context on or perception of time really, because you're like, I'm going to go to training for six months. Uh, I'm only 17 years old. It's like a 20th of my life. I've got to fucking sit. You have no context, mate. And, and you don't have experience, which is, which is what also annoys me when you can vote and be a fucking lefty. So you have zero idea what you're doing. Wow. And sorry, so um, when did you go in? Did you go in like after school, obviously, but a little bit later than Max? Yeah, I got in when I was 20. So I, I, um, I originally applied to be a, a fighter pilot when I was in year 10. I used to be smart um, and, <laughs> and I applied to be a pilot and I started doing like chemistry and physics and, and extension maths and stuff. And then I got paperwork back in the Air Force telling me that, that I was too tall and too big to be a, a pilot. Like the only pilot I think I could have been back then was to fly like big planes or, or um, helicopters. I was like, nah, fuck that. Found out at the same time that I could get a Swiss passport and travel. So I was like, I, I did want to be in the army kind of forever, um, but fighter pilots probably watched like Top Gun or something and thought that was cool for a day. Um, but then, yes, yeah, so I got a Swiss passport, traveled around Europe for two years. Um, and, and then kind of spent the last two years of high school just playing rugby and, and hitting the piss and knowing that I was going to go and travel and then come back and join the army. So I kind of had a bit of a plan. But, yeah, I got in when I was 20. In when I was 20, out when I was 26. Yeah. And you so, guys must have done plenty of travel over those years as well. Yeah, oh, in the army. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Um, Max, Max, operationally, I'll let him go next, but and way more than me too. But I was... I got in at the kind of the in and out at the busiest time ever. So I finished basic training, um, was in Timor two weeks later, um, came back from there, was a little bit naughty, didn't go back for the end of the trip. Um, but that, for punishment, they made me, well, I got to join the army rugby team and go to France and Germany um, on a government funded piss trip. So <laughs> it's kind of, it's kind of a rule with the army. The more you fuck up, the better they treat you. Like, they they punish you from for, for doing really well and performing well. Um, and if you fuck up all the time, they either promote you or, or give you cool courses to do. Uh, and then Afghan, um, New Zealand for rugby again. Fuck, I can't even remember this. But I was I was away at least once a year. Um, I was overseas at least once a year doing something. Like getting to go for rugby trips for work's a pretty good gig. Oh mate, it's the best. It's like. Army, rugby in the army back in the day when it, when operations weren't so high tempo, um, it was all about playing rugby. Um, and the rugby team taught everywhere. They don't do so much anymore, um, probably because they got in trouble every now and then. But it was, we'd go over and it's all young dudes, super fit. Like a lot of, there's, some of the players like leave the army or the defence force side, whichever one it was, to go and play super 14s. Like there has been guys picked up. Um, there's also one of the boys, one of the kids just walking in. One of the boys is, is give me two seconds. <laughs> <I'll let laughs> <make sense. laughs> um, On to your travels next. <laughs> yeah, mate. So I was, we were lucky. And, and that's, I think that's this misconceived conception of, you know, that everyone always talks about bringing the troops home and, you know, get them out of there. They don't want to be there. I'm like, you ask any dude that's in the army, they're like, they would break people's knees to get overseas, mate. And that's operationally as well. Um, I think my first trip was, uh, 2004 and then it went every single year, 2004 Solomon's 2000 and, uh, that was 04, 05, 06 Timor, 07 Iraq, 09 Afghan. And then it all stopped. It was absolute privilege, mate, to, to be able to, to do that. Um, and the full suite. Yep. Yeah. Fuck it. I just got to ask, Max, sorry, how old are you? If you entered when you were 17 <laughs> and you were in there for 18 years. He's 100. Fuck, <laughs> I'm really trying to work this out. Uh, I think I'm 30, I turned 36 on November the 1st. Fuck. And how old are you, sir? 35. Last week. That's how I can remember. Yeah, you are older, but they look way younger than you. Look, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I moisturize. I have a, a, lot, a, 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 life of, a life of chronic cortisol exposure will keep you young, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> it's supposed to do the opposite. 
Yeah, fuck. <laughs> okay. What's training look like for you guys now? Because obviously, I mean, you guys still lifting a bit of weight or um, I mean, it makes you got that epic workout coming out. So yeah, bro, that sounds fucked. Yeah, so um, I was just talking about that Remembrance Day workout we did for oh, Swiss, eh? Oh, mate. So some of the Can't boys... Like... walk. <laughs> <laughs> How long did it take you, sir? Three hours and 44 minutes. Fuck. Jesus. I am out of shape. Bro. Like I, I do weight lift, but I don't do a lot of cardio. And that was that was essentially a, a CrossFit kind of, what do you call them? Chipper. I don't know. One of those disgusting ones that just goes forever. Uh, for, for everyone listening, can you guys please explain this workout again? Mech, sorry. <laughs> yeah, if you, you want to take them through it, and then I'll tell you about the anxiety I've got before I do it. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'll bring I'll bring it up so to get so I don't butcher what was actually in it. Um, but it was for Remembrance Day, obviously the eleventh, the eleventh. So we made it a eleven rounds, eleven movements, uh, eleven reps per movement, and the movements were because um, some of the boys reached out and they said, "Hey, look, we want to help out with this barbecue stuff, and we want to help out Swiss Eight, but we can't because we're locked down in Melbourne because we're doing all the the um, border security stuff. So like, send us a workout." And we're like, righto. Here we go. Sick. Here we go. <laughs> and then I was like, yeah, I'll make him a workout. And then and then Jess, the, the girl who does like our, our comm stuff, she's like, and they asked for it to be really gross. I'm like, they fucking asked for it. So it was 11 rounds of 11 burpees, 11 cal row, uh, 11 overhead press at 40 kilos, 11 squats at 60, 11 heaves, 11 toes to bar, 11 deadlifts at 80, 11 push-ups, 11 cal assault bike, uh, 11 bent over rows at 60 kilos and 11 thrusters at 40 kilos. Uh, so the weights are massive, but 11 reps, 11 times, it Jesus. fucking cooks you. Holy fuck. That's what crazy. <laughs> I can see, I feel you're like, I'm not even doing this workout, Max, and I feel the anxiety now. So the, the mistake I made was, um, and, and I've made this mistake heaps of times, not going first. Um, we did like these capsicum spray in the army and they used to line us all up, right? And everyone was like, no, nah, no, nah, I'll go last. But then you see everyone else in front of you get completely fucked up. And you see like, <laughs> and when you're a young kid and you see people getting capsicum sprayed and there's some of these guys are your role models, like they're, they're, they're these stoic warriors and they just go into water. Well, the same things happen with this workout, I think, because uh, some, some of the current servant two commander boys did this workout and they were like, fucked they like it this is fucked it took them two hours so uh i'm in a i'm in a mad panic so we'll see how we go holy fuck. that's just i don't think i've ever done anything close to that no nope. but i'm not nowhere near fit i walked from one end of a shopping mall the other day to the other and i was breathing heavy so my life now we can do hard we, we had uh the wolf brothers you know the country music singer you know the wolf brothers are down in Taz yep. tassie Yep. Uh, they jumped on. He's Nick. Nick Wolf's a, a mad crossfitter, and he jumped on. And I think they only had they only had a window to to get a, a session in. Um, and I think he only got an hour of it. But he said he was absolutely. He said he was fucked. It was the worst thing. They, got, they got about four rounds done in an hour, which is it's still they must have been moving because I three hours forty four. What does that mean? I can't remember the the breakdown, but I know I got it. <laughs> I got to the first hour mark and I'm like, I haven't even put a fucking dent in this. Um, and I think that's where my heart kind of fell out and everything started moving slower and Does the three hour mark better? crept up real quick. <laughs> what's that? Does this make you feel better about what's coming next, hearing about this? <laughs> no, no. I'm going to take my missus with me to do it um, and she's actually fit. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to be annoying. I'm gonna, I'll video it. I don't think actually Steve, video cameras will record it for three hours. And f I'm thinking this is going to take five hours. Uh, I don't know, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> uh, we'll just hear from you tomorrow and you'll still be in, on the floor somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Fucking hell. Um, what? I don't even know what that says. The what? The what? Were you guys doing, um, I remember Kane talking about a, a stomp. Oh, stomp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Is yeah. that something you're going to try and do again? Well, the problem is this, mate. Um, we had the, we were ready to go. We had everything locked in. That sounded unreal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then we, the, our, our our key support group, so those six dudes that were doing it, yeah. rented their houses or collapsed all their lives. Told kissed their kids goodbye. Told their missus they're going to be on the road for nine months. Oh. And then we drive down, and then literally a week before we step off, or even days before we stepped off. 
they're, they're like, you're locked down. So we had to send, we oh. held on, we held on. We, we were constantly reshuffling um, accommodation and trying to move it around. So we we're like, we can still do this. We can still do it. And then when it become untenable, we we're like, no, nah. how do we spin that back up with those core six people and be like, hey, <laughs> can you kiss your kids goodbye again and sell yeah. your house and we'll crack on. Not, it's all good. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah. how far were you guys going to walk just for those who haven't heard about that before? From Sydney to Sydney, um, around the outside of the country. So there's a bit over 13,000 Ks. Wow. Um, we're going to do, we're going to cover 100 Ks a day uh, in teams, obviously. Not one person doing 100 Ks every day for nine months. Yep. Um, but someone from the six of us would, would cover that 100 Ks a day. Um, wow. And I think, mate, the, the idea, I think we'll be able to bring it back to life again down the track but maybe it'll have to be modified uh unless we do go another year or two and get super excited to do gross endurance stuff yep um but yeah like max said there is no chance we can get those boys the yep. same boys to go unfuck your life again and, and prep to go on the road because they just won't do it um you'd have to do some hectic training for something like that too <laughs> You'd think, you'd think, but we're also dumb grunts, mate. And we started training about three weeks out and we're like, it's walking, bro. What could go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fuck. Everyone, I mean, everyone's relatively fit. Yeah. We just hadn't done a lot of stomping since leaving the well, army. You so. good at stomping pretty quickly, I think. <laughs> yeah, you break, you, I, I, my prediction was we, we break everyone's heart and feet in the first month. And after that, you're on cruise control because it's just Groundhog Day. Um, yeah. So as long as your feet hold out, I think everyone would have been pretty good. I was worried because I thought that working thing, uh, I started walking up here when I was, was getting some injections in my knees to get some cartilage back in there. And uh, I just started walking every day with the missus. And that was like six and a half Ks. And I would come back sore and I'm like, holy <laughs> fuck, they fucking 20 Ks a day for nine months. Yeah. Holy shit. But again, raising awareness for what you guys do definitely would have been worth it. Yeah, I think so. I don't think any of the boys would have given up. I don't think that's none of the boys have got got that kind of in them. But um, getting the major focus was was getting around to each base location. I mean, yeah. the original concept was we raised awareness with our whole Australian community. But then we picked the time where like there was floods mid last year. Then we got bushfires at this time last year. Then the drought was like the main focus. Um, and then we're like, all right, there's Australia's collapsing under natural disaster, and we're trying to raise awareness for veterans. No one's really going to give a fuck. Um, and then COVID hits and we're like, can, can, can Jeebus give us a break? Like just once. Um, <laughs> but the, it, like I said, it turned out to be a blessing in disguise because we didn't have to walk for nine months. And, <laughs> and Australia was awareness of mental health kind of. Yeah. As well. Fucking hell. Now this week, obviously marked remembrance day as well. And how, how important is that day for you guys? I'll let you shoot first if you want, Max. Yeah, I think um, the weird thing is Remembrance Day is supposed to be about, um, I mean, we call it about commiserate, like we, com what do we do? We commemorate. Uh, commemorate, commiserate. We commemorate Remembrance Day, like, and it's supposed to be by verbiage, the everyone that's fought in the wars, past and present, and have made the ultimate sacrifice. Um. And that's, that's what we've traditionally done. And then Anzac Day does feel a little bit more of a celebration of, of the Anzac soldier and, the, and that. I mean, you'll get some grumpy old dudes that are like, no, you should never celebrate war. Like, shut up. We're not talking about that. Uh, America and England. America definitely with their VE Day. So they have the same thing in America uh, at the same time. And that is more of a victory for the end of the war of mm. World War Two or World War One. sorry. Yeah. Um, so for me, it's about, you know, Anzac Day is a massive day. You, everyone gets involved. The whole country have a public holiday. Um, Remembrance Day is like, just pop down, just everyone shut up for a minute and then we'll crack on. Like, it didn't seem like it was in the forefront. And yeah. that's sort of why we sort of tied it up with that. Yeah. What about for you, Sut? Yeah, I mean, it's the same, mate. Like, even when I first joined the military, I remember Anzac Day being a massive deal. Um, if you're on ops, the whole day is a write-off. I mean, obviously not if you, you, you're in gunfights in Afghan, but I was in Timor for my first military Anzac Day, and that was tools down, we're doing Anzac Day. Um, Remembrance Day, like Max said, it was always life goes on as normal, 11 o'clock, all right, just, just shut up for a minute and then go back to work. 
um, which is kind of fucked up. And and it's, I, I I think we were all kind of in the same boat, and we thought that if we we keep going down this path, um, Remembrance Day will no longer be on the calendar in a, in another decade or so. Um, people will just forget it. We're, we've lost. I don't think there's any World War One vets left. Um, by the time all the World War Two vets are gone, who's really going to the RSLs probably dies out with them unless they can really reinvigorate or, or innovate. Um, who's really going to drive Remembrance Day once once they're all gone? Um, so what it was for me before was it was just a day to remember. But now I think we're going to try and turn it into well, turn it into what it originally was, like re reignite what Remembrance Day is and, and try and get the country. Um, to actually pay attention to to what we're stopping for, because like like Max said, we we got some some stick by some v- older generation veterans who missed the understanding. They they forgotten that it was about celebrating the end of the World War, um, and and obviously there's crossovers. You try and find analogies or metaphors to make it relevant for the life that you're living in, and and freedom and and kind of the end of a massive war is, is exactly what we should be trying to celebrate now to remember to remind like americans and and the whole western world to stop fucking fighting each other um and and enjoy the country you live in absolutely does it does those days anzac remembrance they have more weight for you guys now obviously with swiss aid and having friends that have taken their own life does it mean more to you now than it did before or is it just another day where you pay your respects to those who have lost it or made the ultimate sacrifice? Uh, for me personally, I keep them separate. So, uh, I, yeah, I, I don't think, yeah, just for me personally, mate, I don't speak for Swiss aid. Um, I think that I keep Anzac day and remembrance day separate as soldiers who've been and suffered and died in war. Yeah. Um, I know there's a new thing. I, I don't know. There's a new thing now that is that soldiers who've died from their wars, Yep. within at home but for me it's about the dudes who died on operations and served fighting the war fighting that war and and that's it didn't increase the significance working with swiss aid um it increased serving like yeah serving and joining the army was where the yeah i guess if i fucking if i butchered that someone's gonna be you get some hate mail but whatever <laughs> yeah i mean it's 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 one of those um touchy points that, that i guess we started to take because we lost boys at home yeah. Um, we, we lost boys overseas as well in ops, but um, there was obviously plenty of plenty of stuff already happening for the people who, who died overseas. So we started this organisation for the boys that we lost at home, but Anzac Day and Remembrance Day uh, uh, were predominantly days to, to remember boys that died fighting for Australia. Um, at the same time, we, there's I, I think Swiss 8 myself, I don't know about Max, but it definitely, from Anzac Day and Remembrance Day being the kind of emotionally driven days that they are, you're always going to start thinking about the boys that you've lost at home. Um, so I, I guess the only the line I'll draw in the sand is, yes, we want to encourage people to remember um, the boys like Birdie and Curry and, and anyone who's lost at home on either of those days or every fucking other day other than them. But we'll never, um, where, where we can turn like the barbecue into a marketing tool to remind Australia about Remembrance Day, there is not a fucking chance we'll say we'll ever use Anzac Day or Remembrance Day to put one of our mates that's died um, or killed himself in Australia at the forefront of, of, of anything on either of those days. I don't think um, that is the right way to do it. Yeah, it was a fucking good question, mate. But, uh, I'll have to actually go away and think deeply on that one, mate. Yeah, that was a great. That was a fucking ripper. <laughs> <laughs> we have a new saying that we've just discovered here. Um, Rip snorter, apparently. <laughs> like, if it's something really fucking sick, it's just like, like if I pull 300 kilos, it's like, that's a rip snorter of a deadlift. Like, yeah, so you can use that one. That oh, was I'll a, write it down. Yeah. <laughs> it was a rip snorting question, that was. What's the, uh, how much of a deep, how much of a deep dive have you done? What's the origins and the uh, first Oh, use that's as it? far as it goes, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a, uh, it's not a, it in around a while. I only heard the word for the first time, what, an hour ago in our last one. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm you heard rip snort for the first time. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it comes from fucking jokes that make you like snort and oh, there you potentially go. shit yourself. Um, I've, I don't know. I've heard it before. I'm not sure where. Oh, I shit myself a lot, which is embarrassing. <laughs> during squatting? Uh, during squatting, yes. But like I've got some bowel issues. So it's, 
you know the odd you know the saying of like don't trust the fart yeah I'm, i've got a real bad habit of trusting farts <laughs> yeah, it's like you just wouldn't after all the times it's happened i still trust them take two pairs of undies everywhere everywhere i go there's two pairs have you, so have you has there been any horror stories of people like yeah. prolapsing yeah and like oh, out out out. like i won't everyone knows this story in the palatine world but there is someone who shit themselves on the platform is there a shit themselves on the platform yeah bro Ooh, i, I won't drop know. any names on Did it land on the platform it was on the platform there was a shit on the platform there was shit on the platform whoa yeah who he cleans was, that up that's a great question did he clean he shit i don't know no it was a he and Wow. Did you not know that? I did not know that story. Oh, we're gonna... oh, I need to know who it was later. Yeah. But no, yeah, it happens all the time. We have, um, it's like a rite of passage in this sport. Hey, like, you know, if you haven't shut yourself doing some sort of lift, you haven't really, you know, you haven't really lifted pretty much. Like I, we have one guy, Jace Pagan. There was a period there where he would finish a set of squatting. And like, you know, you've probably seen in that videos that, um, you know, we get around, congratulate everyone. And he would just walk straight to the toilet and we would know. <laughs> he just cleaned himself up like but that's <laughs> that went on for like a year anyways too, too much caffeine sometimes things get a little squishy mm. yeah that that's happened a lot i kind of digressed a little bit but uh it was an important question it, it is a very important question went from yeah. putting to shitting ourselves <laughs> that's how we do it on this podcast which is a good oh. segue into tell us about the swiss eight podcast because you guys are, that's fucking taken off rapidly now well yeah it's the uh the yeah it's it was just a go cool, i'm gonna try and navigate this can you navigate it clearer subtle <laughs> than me me it's your podcast mate now i'll have i'll have a crack and then you can fill in the gaps um so understanding your core demographic we had to we where the podcast came from we we sat down one day uh, with Keegan, who's our content kind of pro- always our content producer now, but sat in the room when we were first kicking everything off, going, all right, there's there's a handful of key education pieces that we want to get across to people. One, like explaining anxiety and, and sympathetic, sympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system, um, depression, the, the trip kind of principles. And we started shooting videos and then watching them back, and going, that is fucking dry. I wouldn't it was like it. infomercial fucking. Yeah. So then we're at the same time, like in the same breath, we're like, why don't we just do a podcast, um, talk shit for an hour, try and phase those topics into a conversation, see where it goes. Um, and the first one we did, it was like, we had no idea whether it was going to be a thing or whether we're even going to publish it. Um, it was just camera set up in a room when me, Max and Keegan were having a few beers talking about kind of the mental health journey stuff that we're talking about now. Uh, and in watching it back, like watching parts of it back, I, I think we all kind of agreed, like I would listen to that. Um, so we put it out, gauge feedback, and and a few of the, well, a lot of those actually won. Out of the first 10, that was the most watched one, um, probably because everyone watched it once to do us a favour and then like, fuck these guys. <laughs> no, nah, but it's, it's growing. <laughs> it's growing well now, it. but that was... Get it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that was, it was, it resonated and we got a, a bunch um, of the boys kind of sending us private messages going, that gives me validity to come forward and talk about my shit. And I'm like, well, then it's kind of, it's, it's worth it then if, if even one person comes forward. And I mean, I know it's a bit of a throwaway line, like you help one person, it's worth it. If you had one watcher on your podcast and it was helping them, let's, let's not bullshit ourselves. If we had one viewer on every podcast, we probably wouldn't take the time to podcast anymore. But we had that one person come forward at the start and then it go, you go, oh, fuck, this is actually good. And then you do another one and a couple more people come forward and start, start getting testimonials and, and stuff from it. And it's like, let's, let's run this thing. And I guess the, the follow on piece is it's called instruction sold separately. So ISS by accident, the last three letters in the word Swiss, um, there was no, let's, let's use those three letters and come up with a name we, we were just sitting around having beers one night going, what are we going to call it? It's got to be, something that kind of covers what we're talking about and it is life after the military is uncharted territory um you do not there is no current instruction manual for it um and and that's kind of the basis of the podcast one we're trying to talk to veterans or people in life who have had their ups and downs found their way out and they've got a story to tell they've got some lessons they can pass on to people um definitely steering away from the whole broken veteran narrative which is kind of playing society at the moment some of the bigger charities find the only way they can get funding from companies is to knock on the door and go, 
we look after veterans because they're all fucked and broken when they leave the military. Give us some money. Um, what that does is is kind of perpetuates a cycle going. We're selling the story that they're broken. We're telling them we can do stuff because they're broken. They become broken because they believe that fucking bullshit. So that's what the podcast is, is aiming away from that. Highlight the people who have gone through some real shit and, and come out the other end with stories to tell. But also, um, I think having it off a slightly different brand allows us to be true to our audience. Um, we do, unfortunately, we sort of say, like we're going after that blue collar knock around dude kind of demographic, 18 to 44 blokes. Like I always say to people, building tools, we are open to everyone. Anyone on the planet can download, well, not on the planet, any males, females, any age demographic can download this app. All the tools are relevant to them, but we market to an audience who doesn't respond well to mental health marketing. Um, and part of doing that is swearing and not being PC and flirting with the line of, of like crossing the, because obviously we sent a slight right in, in political beliefs and what we've seen in the world. Um, none of us really respond well to the extremist lefty kind of narrative that's, that's plaguing society at the moment. Um, and, and we're allowed as a charity, we have to be conscious of, of the fact that we're working with government. We're working with big companies. We can't, be blunt in saying we're working with blue collar dudes. Therefore we're going to be fucking scumbags, but the podcast can creep in on that um, where we don't want to go. We don't want to be dickheads about it, but we do be completely transparent and real on the podcast. Um, so yeah, fill the gaps, Max. No, that's it. There's no gaps. I was just worried, I was worried about how we skirt this. this it was the second point. Where to find it. That's all we need now. <laughs> Where is it? I don't know. Keegan and Max run it, so I don't even know where to find it. it I just watch it on YouTube. <laughs> but I think you run it through Spotify, don't you? Yeah, Spotify, Podbean, and uh, YouTube. Yeah. I did yeah. like how you were like, uh, you know, you kind of be a little bit scumbag. And, you know, I was on that podcast, so I definitely fit that mold. So <laughs> Yeah, yeah we, we pick our audiences well, mate. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Nailed it with us and me and Kano. <laughs> Good. No, man, uh, they don't, people don't just, it's just being frank and honest. And, and I guess what I was trying to, what I was uh, worried about circumnavigating was, uh, you know, you should say at mental health charity lobbying government and, and large corporate organizations is one thing. And then if we, we got to slightly change the brand, if we can keep to our demographic and, and get edgy and, and where we're going to be. So, mm. but dude, it's working and, and I'm, um, I get to, I get to have a beer and talk shit with people uh every thursday so it, it's fine with me as well i feel but i feel like what you guys are doing is and you guys said it you know we're in this fucking politically correct world and you're kind of you're not going against it by any means but you're just telling it how it is and i think that's what the fucking more people need to hear is not let's not cater towards people feelings to make everyone feel you know, nice and all, everything's all fucking good all the time. It's like, no, that's not the real fucking world we live in. Just harden the fuck up. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think the big point is um, when you, when you like exposed to like extreme left wing ideology for so long, a lot of people go, all right, I'm going to balance that out by being arrogant and, and offensive to everyone on the other side. And I don't think that's the, that's not really the point of what ISS is trying to do. We're just saying we are, we're not going to, um, Peter to either side we're just going to be people and there is people out there who would see us as blokes just being normal blokes uh, and and not that's not their cup of tea and it's like fucking cool this isn't for everyone um, yeah. but we're not as a charity yeah we, we can't change who we are to fit the current societal narrative because that that is why blokes are dying yeah um, yeah yeah, I think um, because, I mean, there's a lot of, you can, most TV channels are very, very progressive um, and very left-leaning. So there's just no information that people can consume unless you go full right wing, you know, crazy tin hats on, um, where you can just have frank, honest conversation with fucking legends like you boys, you know what I mean? Oh, you guys think we're led? This is the wrong <laughs> You guys are the wrong boys. <laughs> Fuck. Now, lads, Ooh. you guys are doing great things for um, obviously the, the wider community, and it, we'll definitely throw up a whole bunch of links in our show notes for what uh, for what you guys are doing, your podcast, the app, and everything like that as well. But before we finish up, now I'm not sure if you've listened to us up before, 
which we assume you have because you know yeah, we're, still, we're we're amazing as you said before you're a massive massive production yeah yeah 100 percent, like live <laughs> audience and everything um we finish off with 10 of the most important questions you'll ever be asked in your life one two three four yeah so we'll go we'll ask a question and then we'll go max first start second are you ready ready here we go. So you have 30 seconds to tell the world anything you like, starting now. Um, I'm going to take 10 seconds and panic. 30 seconds to tell the world. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. No idea. I'm going to panic and do a workout tonight that I'm going to have to try and dig deep and not quit on. You got and 10 that, seconds. Keep and, going, bro. I'm, and I'm scared. Yeah. And, <laughs> I feel like all we've done on this podcast is make you more anxious for the coming yes. workout. Correct. <laughs> it's only yes, you have. Three to seven hours of training, no big deal. Uh, all so, right. So, 30 seconds. Same question. Same question. Tell the world anything I want. Yeah. Holy fuck. See, that is cortisol brain. Uh, it is. There's nothing I really want to tell the world, but uh, I will tell the world that I'll, I'll just use it as a promo piece, mate. Next year, we have got a minimum of six trips around the country. They'll be advertised on the Swiss 8 website that we want either, well, obviously veterans Tenting. to come on, um, hunting, fishing, fucking dude-based events. Track the website, put your hand up. It doesn't matter where you're from. We want to fucking bring you on these trips. Done. Lovely. That was awesome. All right. Second question. What is the strangest thing you do have or think about i thought that was going somewhere else and I'm like what's the strangest thing you put up your bum but <laughs> you can that's probably that's, a, that's probably a better question uh nothing um no there's a finger's gone up there before but that's okay um i would say aliens i'm thinking i'm thinking yeah there's got to be aliens that's my thing that's what's worrying me at the moment i'm waiting for trump to release some footage i think maybe they, i think maybe they're out there It'd be interesting. And maybe they put things up my bum. We don't know. <laughs> same question, Sat. Same question. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm going in the same boat, mate. Um, nine, everything that I think is normal, apparently, to the rest of the world is fucking strange things to think about. Um, but I'm 99.999% I'm convinced that this is a simulation. Um, anyone I confront with it acts exactly how an NPC would act in a computer game. Um, anyone who's on board with me, um, I mean, I'd, if I go too deep into my theory, there's a 50-50 shot. You'll go, yeah, no, you're just schizophrenic, bro. Um, you can't be working in mental health anymore. <laughs> but sim simulation theory is plausible in my mind. Nice. What is the most important quality in a human? Uh, trust. Nice. Yep. Ooh, it is. I would go empathy. Nice. Now this is where the rip snorter came from. What made up word would you like to see enter the English language? It's not as an actual word. You gotta backtrack with those boys and do it again. <laughs> um What fucking word do you want in English? There's no made up ones, is there? You can make one up. I wish I could. <laughs> uh All right. I was going to answer it with, with a, this is a scapegoat answer, but it falls in line with simulation theory. There is no, humans are physically incapable of coming up with authentic thought. You can't invent new colors. You can't invent new numbers. Trying to do so, your brain fucking implodes. Trying to think of a new word, all you're really doing is sticking two together. So let's make mech sut a new word. Yeah. Wow. You really saved mech there. <laughs> yeah. Now, what are you going to come up with, mate? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. All right, Max. What's your first memory? Um, oh, this is a good one, mate. Um, so I had a girlfriend in kindergarten and oh, yeah, I, was super, I was Superman. She was at wet man or maybe the other way around. I don't remember that well. She weed herself out to change her. Yep. Yeah. And that was the first it. one. That was the end was of that kindergarten. day. Or, or, or there, was, there was a rainbow tent that the little kids wouldn't let me play in and oh. I got upset. So when he unzipped it, I punched him in the mouth. Um, <laughs> probably, probably why I don't like rainbows these days, but who knows? First memory. Um, we actually had this discussion not long ago. My the first, the, the youngest age that I have a memory is when I was about two, standing next to a pink trike at 
my cousin's joint. However, I found, recently found out that there is a photo on the wall of that exact scenario. So it's probably just that I've looked at the photo recently and gone, oh, I remember that. No, you don't, mate. You've just walked past the photo every day of your fucking youth. So, <laughs> who knows? Max, how do you feel about wombats? Uh, they're good. I like them. They uh, break your car. They're tough. Yeah. They break. Don't hit, don't hit them in a the car. That's for Ooh, sure. Oh, that was, was that, is this the question? Was there, is that a follow up for me? That's that's the question. How you feel about wombats? I have, I have no uh, for or against feelings for wombats. The only ones I've seen, I've never, I don't think I've ever seen a live one outside of a zoo. Everyone I've seen is just dead on the highway it's and hard as a rock. So I do not run into them. Yes. <laughs> Uh, what's something you learned last week? Uh, that um, fuck I, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> no idea. Try not to. I don't think it's what I learned. It's try not at this point. It's try not to forget the things I've already learned. It's like a. <laughs> It's like when you're carrying too many schooners on a plate through a pub and as you walk through, shit's falling out. Just trying to keep everything in there. So, no. <laughs> Oh, Sat? Um, I... Oh, this will, this will have to be fairly, fairly cloaked. I learned last week that there are some people in Australia who get in front of the camera pretending they give a fuck about veterans that really don't give a shit. Yeah. We won't say who. <laughs> Damn. But, like that. Um, what is your perfect Saturday Arvo slash evening other than hanging out with us two? Well, yeah, that's what I was going to say first. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I would say... You want a workout for Remembrance Day. No, second least favourite thing to do, I think. <laughs> I don't know, man. I think train hard all week. So Saturday afternoons, chill out, um, watch a movie. Um, like proper relaxation stuff. Yeah. So they are And then it always leads into cheeky bloody don't drink too early. Otherwise you have a big night. <laughs> <laughs> These days for me, mate, if, if, well, to be honest, um, over the last few weeks coming into remembrance day, Saturday Arvos have been, a few of them have been on the piss, but pre that I was on, I was off the piss for a fair bit. Good Saturday Arvo in Maroubra is train, Beach sauna. We got me and Mimi housemate put a sauna in the lounge room. Oh, COVID what? shut. That yeah, COVID shut. Out, COVID shut. COVID lock shut down. Like even when the gyms open up, most of them weren't allowed to turn their saunas back on. So we ended up just buying one and putting it in the lounge room. And that's a fucking good cat? Saturday, Arvo. You got to swap the couch out for the sauna, or you still got the couch? Nah, so it's like open plan, kitchen, big space, lounge room. So now the sauna sits in the middle and divides it. So it's like two separate rooms. It's good. Well, and it's it's a giant wooden like it's a proper cedar sauna. The thing like, is like two, or two lay down beds. Yeah, it's infrared. Um, ah. It's a six man sauna. It's good. Standing. <laughs> Fucking one man if you can. Now, um, <laughs> Brandon loves this question. Do you believe in ghosts? No. Nah. Thank you. I believe in the theory like of ghosts inside the matrix I, I, if this is a simulation then ghosts are ah, mate it's, there's, there's a few variations is either a we have no concept of fucking dimensions or b they we get to a point where the simulation's like all right fucking clear the hard drive control alt delete you know you never delete the entire hard drive there is always shit left on there super tech dudes can go and get a white hard drive and find stuff on there that's what ghosts are Oh. Yes. People's brains are gonna pop. <laughs> Fuck. I was oh, just yeah, like I just wanted to listen to powerlifting, and these fuckheads are talking about computers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just glad you both didn't fuck. So like, I fucking hate all these. Rando loves ghost stories, and fucking Johnny's got a few, and I just like I don't sleep after these podcasts because I'm just like, there's yeah. fucking coming watching me. It's fun to fuck with. Yeah, well, that's why I just blatantly my answer is no, and then I I shut the fuck up and move on. With my, otherwise, I'm like. <laughs> I'm like, but what if? Like, ha. <laughs> right, Max, what's the uh, last words you're going to say before you die? Fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, it's probably going to be something like, actually, probably be like, w- hold my beer, watch this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> oh, fuck. No. Yeah, I don't think, I, I think if I die, it'll be, uh, it'll be, um, 
it won't be a surprise. So it'll be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I reckon my my last words will be something like vanilla, like that was alright. That's alright. That was alright. Fuck you, lads are absolute legends. Thank you so much for joining us on your Saturday Arvo. We all we know you have a perfect Saturday Arvo routine, so we do appreciate the time you've given up. Um, for people who are wanting to reach out and look at a little bit, little bit more of what you do, where can they find you? Uh, Swiss8.org. Um, I'll let Max do the podcast stuff because I'll, I'll fuck it up again. But yeah, Swiss8.org where, where everything, all of our stuff can be found. Yeah, and then the, it's just instructions sold separately on Podbean, YouTube and um, Spotify. But you can find, go follow us on Facebook or um, you can see some of the links through the uh, Swiss8 website as well. Thanks, guys. Hey, eh? no worries. Yeah, good. We'll uh, we'll chuck all that up in our show notes. And again, thank you so much for uh, just giving up your Saturday, Arvo. Cheers, Thanks for having guys. us on, mate. Appreciate it. Thanks, no lads. Great to Thanks, meet you. Lads.